So I think another, not another note to me, so I'm not on mute. Um, before that, he was at Uber and then at Voyage. But what I'm most excited about regarding his background is that he was actually the principal tech advisor for the former, former California Attorney General, who I like to call Madam Vice President. And um, when he was at the department, he was working on different privacy data and tech platform issues. Um, he's trained as a lawyer and also spent quite a few years at McKinsey working on their cities and social sector projects. Um, we have a about 50 minute long agenda for all of you today, um, where we'll talk a little bit about what led Justin to trust and safety, the day to day work of what being in trust and safety involves, and then also um, asking Justin a few things on what he thinks, um, where he thinks trust and safety will go. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over to Justin. As questions come up, we'd love to incorporate them, um, not just at the end, but as we go throughout the discussion as well. So just ping questions to Stanley Chen, um, and he will make sure that we get to them. Cool. Um, so Justin, question for you. Could you do a little bit more justice to your background and introduce yourself to us in your own words? Sure. Um, well, first of all, it's super exciting to um, be chatting with you all. Um, I've known Jen for quite a while in the Renaissance Collective when it first started and uh, was thinking that it was such a cool and, and well-needed organization. So normal uh, uh, I'm uh, really looking forward to the conversation. Um, so yeah, I, just uh, me and my own words. Uh, I've had sort of a, an interesting potentially windy career to tech policy uh, and particularly trust and safety policy. Um, I was always interested in, uh, in sort of social impact and, and um, uh, uh, social good. And my way was started in the law and I about being impact litigator uh, for the ALU. Uh, and then I discovered how long cases take to be heard and um, I was too impatient for that. So then I left the law and that's why I went to McKinsey to do strategy consulting uh, where I worked in the public and social sector. Um, but interestingly, um, right before I went to law school, I did uh, uh, an internship uh, at the district attorney's office of San Francisco and I worked closely on policy with uh, the district attorney of San Francisco at the time, Kamala Harris. And then when I was um, at McKinsey, I then took a leave of absence when she was elected to the Attorney General's Office of California uh, work on her transition team. And then um, right around the time I was planning to leave McKinsey and I was actually looking to join the tech sector, um, uh, she reached out and um, I, uh, I joined her team to lead tech policy, tech strategy uh, and tech litigation. Uh, and that was a pretty fascinating um, uh, couple of years and so I first started working on a bunch of the platform issues with Google and Twitter around cyber harassment and revenge porn and or non-consensual image sharing as it is now called um, and um, found that area just super fascinating and um, uh, trying to understand this like self-regulatory concepts um, and and what is the responsibility of companies to sort of proactively regulate versus wait for guidance from um, governments to basically set the standards. Uh, and um, all of those debates that we were happen having in 2015, uh, 2016 are certainly all coming uh, right to the fore uh, in the past several months, certainly in the coming months. So definitely an interesting time there. And um, was planning um, probably to go to, to work more directly on tech platforms until at the very end of my tenure at the AG's office, um, autonomous vehicles, uh, came to the forefront uh, when there was a, an issue with um, Uber and the California DMV that I had to step in and sort of help try to resolve. Um, uh, we were representing the California DMV at the time and um, that really uh, sparked my interest in sort of the overlap of, uh, of my interest in cities plus emerging tech. So dabbled in that for a few years and then when COVID happened um, and all of life was moving online and TikTok reached out for this uh, trust and safety policy role. I thought this would be a pretty fascinating time to join. Uh, and, and I got more than I bargained for because I think three weeks after I joined, Trump issued an executive order uh, threatening to ban TikTok from the US. So that was like, uh, uh, 
for those of you who watch Arrested Development, I think I had my like, I've made a horrible mistake moment, um, uh, which was, was pretty funny. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, obviously, when watching the news knows um, we continue to, uh, uh, to navigate the storm. It has been a, a fascinating, fun, um, super fast growth, wild ride. Uh, and I just saw one, one uh, chat, which I thought was sort of funny how life works. Um, I was in Hong Kong uh, the fall of 2019, I guess. And my friend was telling me about this new app called TikTok. Uh, and I was like, oh, it sounds a little strange. Uh, and then um, I, I sort of imagine only because he told me those many months before that like primed me to be ready for when they reached out. Um, and I was like much more receptive to the receptive to the call. So um, just a great example of serendipity. Okay, so that was that was long words, or at least a long stretch of them. So I'll, I'll pass it back to you, Melba. Yeah, so I'm curious, out of all those different things that you did, like the consulting experience, working with government, um, your legal training, which of those things do you think um, helps you the most in your day to day? Or what kind of what of your experiences do you think makes you best prepared for a trust and safety role? Good question. Um, I'm gonna hedge because I think I wear like two, two different hats all the time. Um, so one of the things that's nice about being a lawyer uh, but not being in law is um, you have a great structure and training and background to understand a lot of issues. And so one way in which I see trust and safety policy is you're basically sort of creating legislation or, you know, for a community um, or, you know, a platform. Um, and so in many ways, a lot of the work that I've done in government was sort of my legal training. I, I find I'm doing here where I'm issue spotting, you know, where there could be um, challenges or, um, uh, potential harm to the community and trying to get ahead and create policies and, and laws um, to protect to protect folks. Um, so in that way, I, I, I'm probably as close to being a, a real lawyer uh, as I ever imagined being, not as an actual lawyer. So it's 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 uh, been quite a fun space. But I also end up pulling a lot of my McKinsey background as well um, for two reasons. One, uh, as a fast growing startup, my team has grown from 10 to 30 already, and we're growing. Uh, Quite a bit more and so there's a lot of like organizational and operational um, improvements and, and fixes that I need to be thoughtful about as I grow my team uh, but I think the other thing is um, just uh, it looks like there's some McKinsey consultants on this group I'm noting from Jen just the concept of being what we would call 80-20 uh, where how can you make a decision like really fast or do just enough research um, to come up with a decent answer and not let the perfect be the enemy of the good is basically the thing that we need to do all the time in trust and safety. Um, we don't operate on like two year legislative cycles and really make sure that we've, uh, you know, analyzed everything uh, uh, six ways from Sunday, um, which may or may not be the right actual phrase. I don't uh, totally remember, but uh, just is probably understood. Um, but we have to make some pretty snap decisions. And so being able to uh, quickly analyze uh, a lot of fast moving uh, trends and, um, and make some decisions uh, in a structured but efficient way is, is probably the, the core of trust and safety policy. And so uh, in that way, I find I end up sort of integrating both parts of that background pretty frequently. Yeah. And do you think that's necessary for anyone working in trust and safety or is it for someone leading the team? There are probably, you know, a handful of positions like yours in Silicon Valley right now. Um, but I know that there's a lot of excitement with becoming an operator in that space, maybe at a lower level. Um, so what do you think? Is that something you look for when building a team? Um, so no, neither of them are, um, are uh, prerequisites, I'd say. Um, I think uh, there are Probably, well, as a former consultant, there are three things that I look for because I'm also always supposed to say three things no matter what the actual answer is. And I'll try and come up with the three on the fly as I go. Um, so uh, I think one thing is just uh, a real ability to adapt to massively changing circumstances, being flexible. Um, and um, 
sort of scrappy. Uh, things change so fast and there's so much that needs to get done. You just need to have someone um, uh, who, can, who can go with the flow uh, and they sort of can figure out their own path rather than have that path be, be given to them. So I think that's actually one of the things that in fast growing tech companies, you'll see people um, look for a lot. They'll often unfortunately use experience at a previous tech company as a proxy for that sort of skill, which of course makes it difficult to break into tech. But I think ultimately um, much of what people mean by, oh, they've worked in tech means they get fast moving high growth organizations and they can operate and swim and you don't have to worry about them sort of being overwhelmed. So that's probably the most important piece. Um, I, I think the second piece that I particularly look for on the policy side is, is um, do you have uh, a strong conceptual or analytical approach to breaking down problems? So probably as a former consultant myself, I, I um, worry less about does someone have a deep domain expertise in an area, but how quickly can they learn or do they have a natural grasp of the concept? So I'll throw out any one of various policy challenges that we have to make on a daily basis and just see how people grapple with it. And do they like spot the major issues? Can they come up with some ways that they might um, uh, address it? Um, and uh, do they feel like they could learn with, you know, the relevant coaching and mentorship from more senior people? And then I think the third piece, which um, is becoming just more and more clear to me as I uh, work in larger organizations is, um, do you have the ability to be a good cross-functional partner? So, so much of policy and tech policy in particular, there's so many overlapping areas. So, you know, if we have someone working on harassment and bullying and someone else working on hate speech, at some point, they're going to have to figure out how to collaborate on on topics that like we don't know is it exactly prejudicial bullying or is it is it like clearly racist speech or uh, whether it's more of a policy issue versus like a program management issue in the end you just need people who can figure out how to work together and um, uh, and jointly solve problems and and that's you know in the end what allows you to go really fast it's uh, probably the analogy there is uh, in the, like can we all pull the oars in the same direction so those are probably the three main things that I look for. Um, and then um, presume that people can, can learn on the fly if they've got the, the enthusiasm. Yeah, and learn kind of the, the policy and the legal frameworks. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, kind of shifting into what your day-to-day -day looks like. That's what I'm really curious about. I imagine you're super slammed, especially with what you were saying at the beginning um, with how much TikTok has been in the news, but um, on your day-to-day, -day, what are the different responsibilities and priorities that you feel like are in tension with each other or that are competing for your time? Um, is it, you know, civil society? Is it kind of the, maybe the brand team? Is it, um, yeah, I don't even know. What is it? Yeah, I don't even know either. It's, uh, it's so overwhelming. I can't keep track. Um, no, okay. So, uh, I think there are a few different tensions uh, that go on and, and some I can talk about my level and then I could talk about some of the, the issue leads on my teams because some of their day-to-day uh, uh, -day challenges are also super interesting. So for me, um, I think a lot of my time is how to balance the urgent versus the important mm -hmm. uh, and how to handle critical near-term decisions about building for the future. So um, like I still need to hire like so many people and the team needs to grow. And if we don't grow, we can't handle all of the mountain of incoming that we will need to tackle in the future. But also there's a bunch of really meaningful, critical decisions that we need to get right today. So I spend a lot of my time just basically switching from trying to push on um, more strategic long-term work versus like the burning, the burning issues of the day. And um, for those of you, mm -hmm. you uh, who know, who have like experienced going from deep work to like uh, various firefighting, uh, you can probably appreciate just how much of a challenge it is to do good deep work. So I probably spent a third of my time just feeling uh, how ineffective I'm being in the other two thirds of my time. Um, but uh, yeah, I think sort of uh, tongue in cheek is I like probably spend like a third of my time doing like more strategic planning uh, vision documents, org strategies. Um, I just, we're just launching a new responsible innovation function uh, within TikTok. 
Um, so I've been doing a lot of external research um, about peers and, and, um, uh, and how external experts have tried to navigate this space uh, and then doing a lot of um, sort of internal stakeholder meetings on that. Um, then um, probably more of like a set of near term things is dealing with daily escalations around, you know, is this content uh, too sexualized for um, this audience or, or for this uh, creator? Or um, does this uh, comment or um, video cross the line from, uh, you know, free speech to uh, hate speech um, that we want to take down? Um, and then, uh, so handling a lot of those sort of direct escalations um, and then uh, a lot of mentoring um, the folks on my team uh, on a, a bunch of the topics they're, they're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis um, mm -hmm. as they're sort of drawing their portfolios. Um, and one thing that's probably worth articulating, um, the policy team in particular um, has, it's sort of interesting, it has both what I would call, you're gonna hear a lot of bad or, um, or uh, potential stretch analogies to government uh, based on my past, but I see us as both the legislative branch and the judicial branch, mm -hmm. um, but like on a more senior level. So we've got a lot of moderators who look to apply our um, policies at the, at the sort of base level, and then we get uh, handled a lot of the appeals. Yeah. Um, so there's kind of like this, this near term putting out fires, this long term or longer term setting policy, setting precedent, and then growing your team. Sounds like the three things I heard you right. Yeah, see, it's always, it's always back to three. By the way, Stanley has asked a question about extending the analogies and I'll never miss an opportunity to extend my favorite analogy. Uh, so who, who are and who should be the judges or the courts? Um, so I alluded to it, but let's run in, in more depth. Um, we have a bunch, thousands of moderators who take our policies and review individually um, as they come in. Uh, basically, if a video gets enough above enough views, we will review it against our policies. We also use machine learning to try and capture some of the things that may, um, that may go against our policies. Um, the moderator teams basically make some initial decisions and sometimes they have their sort of um, small appeals process internally. And you can think of that for, for uh, law geeks among us as like the administrative law judge system, I think, uh, or maybe they're the trial judges, who knows. Uh, but then at some point it gets escalated to, you know, we might be the, the federal court of appeals and or the Supreme Court um, within TikTok and, and we'll make the, the final big decisions. Um, it's interesting to uh, explore, by the way, for, for those who have watched what Facebook did with its, over, its oversight administration board, which I think was a very cool experiment and we're certainly watching it. Um, they took a view of like an ultra Supreme Court that might hear only a handful of cases by external uh, bodies. And one of the things that's interesting to note there is um, you can tell from some of their first decisions that they're still a little disconnected about the challenges or like what it takes to moderate at scale. Mm -hmm. um, and so it highlights just the critical importance of bringing sort of external expertise with sort of baking in the, the true uh, complex and, and vast nature of trust and safety. Um, because I think a lot, of, a lot of what they talk about certainly makes sense in more of like a traditional legal framework, but um, uh, just a little bit harder to implement uh, at scale um, in a fast moving growth environment like the social media. Uh, but anyway, so that, that, that's my, uh, my answer, Stanley, on, on the, uh, the, court, uh, the court analogy extension. Um, and uh, I'm still working on, uh, on what the analogy would be for agency law. Um, but it is interesting to note that Twitter, I believe actually recently, uh, speaking of agency law, Twitter recently, I think, is exploring a public comment period uh, for some of their new community guidelines, which, um, as some of you may know, is sort of uh, required as a part of any agency rulemaking. So, um, uh, so we're definitely also starting to try and think about what are, what are potential ways we can increase more of the sort of community voice in our own policymaking as well. Yeah, hearing you talk about that makes me think, what are conversations like between the companies to the extent you can share? 
Um, is it kind of a camaraderie of we're all facing the same issues, let's talk about what's worked, or does it feel proprietary, like we want to figure this out before you do? It's interesting. I, I think one answer is it probably is different from group to group. Um, I'm struck by, I have a lot of friends at, at other companies mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, we, you know, we chat a lot. I, I think um, I take a lot of uh, inspiration from um, one of my friends at Facebook who's leading responsible innovations, Vika Krieger. Uh, and so I like always pick his brain or, or I'm starting to as we try and grow the function and he's been um, an, an amazing thought partner. Um, I think there is probably healthy competition in other areas uh and um uh and um so yeah i think i think it probably differs I, I think everyone does probably realize uh to some extent um that on some level we're sort of all in this together uh particularly as government regulation uh becomes more and more a, a likelihood on the horizon um that uh you know Many of many of these platforms, while there's different features, different problems, different challenges, different users, will all all user generated content platforms will have the same challenge of um, you either need to be in a place where the default is it can be posted and we can try and handle we can try and minimize the damage or or harms once posted, or if you get into a place where you have to start more carefully vetting content. Um, on the front end, it will drastically change the volume and I think nature of uh, what these platforms are capable of. So I think um, we will all find common cause in, in that um, in that sort of scalable, sustainable regulatory framework. Yeah, I'm sure there's also a lot to kind of not commiserate isn't the word that I'm looking for, but I'm sure you all kind of have similar relationships to the rest of your companies. Um, so that might kind of be a shared experience as well. Um, and That'd be cool to hear about as well. Like, how do you relate to TikTok as a whole? Is it maybe I'm completely wrong? Maybe there isn't as much of a um, adversarial relationship between your function and kind of the the revenue growing functions. So I can only speak to my experiences at TikTok and not other companies. But a couple observations. Um, one is that I do think this is take this with a grain of salt because it's a very small sample size. But one thing I have noticed is that policy teams in general tend to have maybe a little bit more camaraderie with fellow companies than say ops teams because the business goals look pretty different. Like one is around user growth and revenue, which oftentimes are fighting for the same market share. Whereas the policy teams are both, you know, tend to be, how can we do this like safely and responsibly? Uh, how can we make sure that we like issue spot and get ahead of problems? And so, um, probably the metric, it allows us to have more collaboration just naturally. I, I found that in in, um, in Uber and Voyage as well. Um, so that's just one general observation. Um, within TikTok, one thing that's sort of interesting to note is where you place trust and safety policy may have some implications. So we are within the product operations org and mm -hmm. report up separately from public policy. I think some other companies um, have content policy or trust and safety policy with within a broader public policy org. Um, so it's interesting, you can imagine that some of the dynamics could change a little bit if you're in the same org that is more closely attuned to um, sort of government, what government is pushing on. So that's just one observation for TikTok. A thing that I have probably enjoyed and is I think a nice part of TikTok is we're newer. So um, some of the business models and products and all that are in earlier stages of development. So um, we have a great opportunity to engage with a lot of our, our product stakeholders earlier on before things are too um, fixed in one way or the other. So I think there's like probably a little bit more openness and flexibility generally. And I think too, TikTok really benefits as like a generate a second generation um, platform, which is we've seen all that has worked well and all the challenges of our more mature peers. And we are, I think, all aware of the need for improvements in certain areas. So I think there's like just a little bit more of an openness and instinct um, to engage in those debates. I've actually found some of my my product and algorithm colleagues like um, 
pretty amenable to some some conversations. And you know, of course, over the coming years, we will continue to see if we can uh, we can um, live up to the sort of the ideals that we have now. But um, I've definitely found um, uh, that I have not had to sort of convince people about the importance of the conversations in a way that you know I might have thought I had otherwise. Totally. That I feel like that learning curve is such a big win for for all for everyone working in the space and also for society as a whole. Um, so it's not just on your shoulders to kind of teach the importance of the work that you're doing within your organization. Yeah, exactly. Um, Stanley posed a good sort of follow up question to this, which I'll weave in. Asked, uh, when you say you are a part of product, uh, how embedded within product teams are you? How much attention do they pay? I say this as a lawyer, sometimes advising deaf ears on product teams, uh, which I mean, certainly relates. I've, I've been there. So one of the things that I think is interesting about trust and safety policy um, is, you know, I, I, I think you can imagine the world of platforms as a couple of different things. There's the content that is shows up um, on the platform, like what is served to you. And then there's probably the actual product itself, like the app and the features on the app. So um, one reason we're in product operations is uh, we are part of the product. And what I mean by that is we're making decisions about what is acceptable uh, or, or what is not acceptable to have on the platform. And so uh, our team, along with our content programming and, and algorithm team sort of all together um, shape ultimately what, uh, what TikTok users can see. Mm -hmm. um, so we're you know, helping to make decisions around what is in the content library uh, and then in combination with content programming and, and the algorithm team uh, sort of end up shaping what is put in your for you fees. But um, so in some ways we're making direct decisions um, about uh, some of these things, which is why for you know the legal geeks among us, it's like it's as close to being a part of product as you can without having been like a PM. So that that's sort of part one. Part two is um, we also with interest and safety have like a product management function. So we build features um, that help keep things safer. Like how can you hide comments if they're you know super uh, offensive, so you aren't subject to a bunch of you know trolls. Uh, if you just want to like post in peace um, or like if you want to, uh, if we need a mask layer for content that might be too visual, um, these are features that we you know will champion uh, as, as important and then we'll, um, we'll work with uh, our, our product team to help build that. So in that way, again, we're sort of uh, a little bit more um, a part of the core strategy. Then I think there's other, um, there's going to be other types of products that are probably more in this uh, zone that Stanley referred to where, where it's like more clearly an advising type concept. And so this is partly what the responsible innovation function that we're trying to build out uh, is going to be focusing on, but how to try and work with product teams early on to be aware of the potential for um, uh, mental health and well-being and like spending too much time watching TikTok and like, are we building in the right checks on that? Or, um, can we encourage privacy by design uh, as we build out new features uh, and, and use of like geolocation? So I, I, I would be naive if I didn't think that there will be um, certainly uh, other areas of product uh, more on like the feature and side. Uh, we're certainly um, not, you know, deaf, hard of hearing. Um, but uh, but th that's sort of uh, what I mean by embedded in product a bit. Um, so there's sort of two flavors there. Yeah, especially as it relates to making product impacting decisions or just the other policy calls that you're making throughout your day. What are the frameworks that you feel like you pull on? Are they company values? Are they you know human rights values that you learned while in law school? Um, are they like Justin's personal values? What a great question, which tees up on one of the biggest projects that I'm working on right now, which is um, this exact topic. Um, we have a bunch of policies that we've created uh, that have sort of come down from um, some sense of, of what is appropriate uh, that are driven a bit by the mission uh, uh, of TikTok, which is um, uh, to inspire creativity and create joy. Um, and it's worth noting, by the way, for uh, sort of the, the distinction that 
when you look at TikTok versus some of these other platforms, the other platforms really orient around prioritizing expression. Uh, and so what that means is when you really orient primarily around expression, and, and there's many good reasons to do that, you end up with a lot more content that may have some vitriol um, or, or real harm. Um, and it, it, um, it sort of can change the nature of uh, the, the overall experience of the community. I think um, because there's this like sort of joy connectivity, more like celebrate humanity aspect of the TikTok mission, we probably um, put the thumb on the scale a bit differently when we're balancing free expression and harm. So I think um, that's, that's sort of like at an overall area I think one one um, sort of key thing that's different. But to go back to your like frameworks, um, I'm in the midst of trying to develop um, uh, with some some other folks in trust and safety leadership a content charter um, that will help basically guide some of our, our big uh, decisions and in, in gray areas. So we can think of this, I guess, if the policies that we have are like the the statutes, this would be like the the constitution that we would look to. Um, to decide if, if these statutes are like balancing things right or, or um, to help guide in, in um, uh, interpreting gray area cases. And, and so where this really manifests itself is, uh, you know, we've got a set of principles that we stand for, like authenticity, transparency, um, uh, creative expression, uh, mitigation of harm. But the, the real challenge is it comes into what happens when these principles are in tension. Um, so, for example, human rights, which you mentioned, one of our principles is celebrating human rights. And then we've got another principle around uh, local social norms. Um, so um, we try and have a little bit more of a regionalized approach with policy than like one one size fits all global approach. So how do we handle things that we think may run, you know, may run in tension between uh, uh, a regional social norm and a, uh, a global human right? So I think those are some of the things that we're looking to get uh, develop more clarity on about how might you balance and in which which ways would you default and in which situations might you make exceptions um, yeah. but I think it's uh, trust and safety is basically just like one constant gray area uh, and so um, continuing to develop and flesh those frameworks out so you have more consistent and thoughtful answers but then ones that we can be transparent about uh, is going to be a lot of the work for our team in the next year. Yeah, Justin, do you think that would be an internal to TikTok thing or um, is there a chance those values might get shared out kind of as a thought leader in the space? So we'll definitely, once we finish them, we'll, we'll um, figure out a way to articulate some, some form of them publicly, um, not simply to be a thought leader, but also because um, a good part of any legal system, if you will, is due process and how transparent the process is uh, separate from any substantive outcomes, right? So um, one of the things that I think will be key for all these companies to do is just continue to be more transparent about how they, how they do things. So at least everyone is on notice and, and they have the right expectations. Um, so I think uh, just as we have community guidelines, which are a public facing version of our policies, We'll, we'll figure out some analog um, that may not you know, be in as much detail uh, with as much verbiage um, as is internal, but, uh, but a way that is digestible and, and sort of easily understandable for, for our common users or our, our, yeah. our users, I should say. Definitely. Um, as someone who worked on trying to launch Trust and Safety at a much smaller company, I can tell you that the work and thinking that that bigger companies like you guys do is much appreciated by some of the smaller fish in the sea. Um, so that'll be exciting when it comes out. Um, we're getting a lot of questions on kind of what the day-to-day -day policy challenges at TikTok specifically are. Um, so I'd love if you could speak to that for a few minutes before we jump into kind of our next category of questions. Um, specifically, someone said compared to other social platforms, uh, TikTok has a lot of kids on it. How are trust and safety issues more challenging when users are under uh, when users are underage? Um, so either that or just the the daily policy challenges. We are yeah. So um, I think user safety for minors is probably one of our our biggest focus areas. Um, you know, our users our user base is is um, 
uh, has quite a bit of, of, of youth on it. And so that um, requires sort of extra diligence. So I think at a high level, what it means is um, uh, we tend to have um, a set of policies that are specifically targeted towards minors. And we have um, uh, folks, uh, they have to opt into what age they are. And if, if you're under a certain age, you know, you're limited with certain features. Um, I think under 13, um, you either in some countries can't use the app or you have a completely different sort of private uh, private experience. Um, if you're under, I think, 16, you can't use some of our features like Duet uh, uh, because we found that it increases the risk of, um, of bullying. So there's one set of features we sort of limit uh, for that reason. Um, and then, um, you know, there, there are two types of major issues. Um, I mean, there's multiple, but sort of two major buckets. One is we want to make sure we're mitigating any developmental harm of um, the miners themselves as viewers. And then two, with a lot of uh, users, we want to make sure you know, they're not subject to things like grooming or, or child uh, exploitation or, or issues like that. Um, and this is definitely where you see some of the, the, the potential darker sides of, of trust and safety and humanity. Um, so you know, we, um, uh, we try and be pretty thoughtful about what are some of the things that we think are developmentally inappropriate um, for kids. Um, and then uh, we have very uh, strict policies around things like uh, child sexual abuse material and, and other, um, other things of that nature. I think um, one of the um, things that uh, is challenging is um, we, we don't, always know or, or we can't always 100 percent rely on the age as self-reported but on the other hand if we try to do too much if we try to use too many other signals or data available uh, that can create some sort of privacy issues uh, and then the privacy community would also sort of raise some some concerns so there there is a bit of a challenge on just figuring out the nature of um of uh the, the users um so what, what that ends up looking like is, particularly in our For You feed, on the whole, we tend um, to be a little bit more cautious about what ends up getting there um, uh, than, than you know, might exist in the, in the general content, uh, content library. Um, so as, like a, as a maybe bad analogy, you can imagine you'll find a lot more R-rated content in the content library, but we're trying to keep the, we're trying to keep the, um, the For You feed a little bit more PG-13. Mm -hmm. Totally. Um, thanks for speaking to that. We have another question that I think kind of ties in. Um, you spoke to how, like with different child groups, you think, you think a lot about, you know, what's appropriate for each age range. Um, the question that we got is on regionalization. So again, thinking about, um, kind of catering content specifically to different areas or to different groups. Um, so we had a guest say, I assume consulting external and local expertise stakeholders is especially important as um, in how it relates to regionalization. Are there any guiding principles you use when you rely on outside on outside experts or when you don't rely on outside experts for this type of regionalization work? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, uh, I did remember one other thing on the other uh, question around youth and I'll, I'll turn to that is, Part of what we're also looking to do in the coming um, the coming year is to focus on a content classification system that can sort of more clearly give age ranges or like actual ratings to mm -hmm. to some of the content, so we can um, make sure that we're serving the right content to the right people. And interestingly, on a side note, um, one of the things that we're also thinking about is sometimes uh, you know you don't want kids seeing certain adult behavior, but there's also a lot of you know, kids making content, as we've noted, and sometimes adults don't really want to see a lot of uh, kid creator creators either. So they're sort of a two way street, basically, of how do you serve the content that is most appropriate, and interesting to the right groups. Anyway, um, switching gears on the regionalization. It's a it's a very good question. Um, one of the things that I really have appreciated with my time at TikTok is this concept that um, the Internet is a global thing, but we are are social norms and preferences look different from region to region. So um, 
we have one adopted an approach of creating global frameworks that then um, country policy managers will take those global frameworks and customize them for the regions that they cover. So we get a little bit more um, uh, sort of cultural nuance and, and make sure that um, we're not imposing any one set of uh, cultural values on another, unless we think, as I noted, they're like pretty critical, like uh, we're, we take pretty strong lines on hate speech or, or or you know um, minor safety issues, regardless of the of the um, region. But you know we want to allow uh, content in more liberal markets. Um, you know where certain norms you know may be more open around sexuality, but um, we wouldn't apply those same uh, things in areas like the Middle East, for example. Um, so uh, with that long-winded intro, um, how do we use experts? Well, in a couple ways. One is we're setting up um, trust and safety advisory councils in each of our major regions, where we try to bring experts um, who can speak to some of the issues that are most relevant uh, to those regions. Um, so like for Brazil, there's like major issues with, uh, with racism and, and structural racism um, and hate speech. Uh, there's a lot of uh, you know, open questions around sexuality, uh, election integrity, misinformation are some of the, the key topics. So we're building out advisory councils there that will bring experts who can sort of uh, help us better understand the nature of, of those areas. Uh, and we do that, um, we're doing that for basically each of the regions. And then at the same time, so we'll, we'll be meeting with those folks regularly. Um, at the same time, we also have an outreach and partnerships team who engages with the community and um, local NGOs and civil society folks, as well as partner with our, our government um, our public policy team to basically make sure we're hearing a little bit more from like the people on the ground. Uh, and we're just building out a new sort of community engagement function to make sure that we're understanding um, sort of what the, the views are, are both of our creators and some of the user base. So we're trying to create a little bit more of a feedback loop. Um, so we can make sure that, um, you know, as we, uh, uh, grow in many regions that we're less you know familiar with uh that we have a good sense of what's going on um and can be responsive uh to some of these issues and, and you know in part we've we've been able to know that this is something that we should do ants um because there can be real issues uh, uh with how these these platforms are, are used um in, in areas uh, where you know you may not speak the language, many of your staff may not speak the language, and so um, uh, you know there's uh, with other platform companies. You know, we know having some people with local language and, and connections to to local civil society is pretty yeah. Um, I must say that is far beyond what I would have expected. So that's really cool and in a way beautiful to get to hear about that. That's um, that that level of nuance is bringing being brought to the policy work that TikTok is doing. Um, I'm going to switch us a little bit into thinking about the vision and direction um, that you have in coming to TikTok and coming to the space. Um, kind of one question here that I imagine, Justin, you might have gotten from friends so far or when you kind of made the leap from some of your other jobs. Um, but obviously, there's the there's the part of how TikTok is being discussed in the news. Um, and there are questions around like how TikTok could be used potentially for surveillance by foreign state actors. I imagine that's a lot of what your work, you know, as a, as a person trying to keep these platforms safe. I imagine you've gotten that question. Uh, and if maybe thought about it yourself, what, how have you kind of parsed through it or thought about it? It's the first time someone's asked me. No, that's not true at all. <laughs> um... <laughs> like, oh no. Yeah, uh, bike dances from China, who knew? Uh, no, it's obviously uh, um, a pretty uh, central part of the story and, and makes it complex. Um, and, and it evokes so many different thoughts. So, uh, and I've, I've thought about this in a few ways. So one is um, there's the like, how, how do things like work in practice versus like the, the theoretical? Um, and one of the things, you know, uh, I could be wrong, but I, I'm pretty sure that we are not just like channeling data back to um, back to, to the Chinese government. And in fact, um, the way trust and safety is structured is really trying to 
uh, get ahead of exactly that, um, which is um, there's a whole separate TikTok app in China called Duyan, um, which I may be mispronouncing. Um, and they exist just within China. And then TikTok is everywhere but China. And then um, Global Trust and Safety, uh, uh, which started in Beijing, has now been moving out. Um, and so most of the decision making um, on, on the policy side happens uh, in, uh, in the, our three hubs in Dublin, Singapore, and, um, and uh, uh, the Bay Area. So there's been a goal to sort of make this a global company. Um, and that, that was very intentional. And I think in some level, this is like the first company that's attempting to be global, not from the US uh, in, at this uh, scope. So it makes it quite interesting. Um, you know, I think, obviously, I think a lot of the concern around the surveillance has to do with sort of um, the laws around what China can can ask for if it's the company. I think that from what I know, the data is localized in, in other areas to try and get ahead of that. Um, but but there is a there is always the the natural question of like, let's ask the hard what if questions. Um, and like, you know, I totally get that instinct. I think if I were to sort of rank the like, what are the major issues? The what if question is probably, that what if question is probably less top of mind than like, how is everyone including all of these tech companies using the algorithms appropriately? Um, uh, you know, so I think those are the questions that I think probably are, might be a little bit more front and center, um, but maybe they make for a little bit more of a complicated news story. Um, but I, I think, um, I guess what I'd say is like, I understand the concerns theoretically. I don't, I personally thought about it myself and made the decision that I was comfortable. Uh, one, that it wasn't being used for nefarious purposes or, uh, you know, when you think about how Facebook and, and Cambridge Analytica was sort of happening, like um, we've got a broader question, just how data is being used that I think we need to work uh, more strongly on. And then I think two, the other sort of interesting thing that I have found about TikTok is because it has these global ambitions, it knows that it has to overcome a lot of the skepticism about its origins. So on some level, I found it like wanting to, being willing to work harder um, than maybe fellow, fellow companies who don't have to overcome that skepticism. Um, and, and that, as someone who's like advocating for tech for good, I have found useful internally to basically say like, hey, here's a way that, that TikTok can demonstrate that it is like trying to like be at the forefront of um, uh, from tech for good. Um, and so, uh, so I think that um, counterintuitively can like help uh, make the case for like the responsible innovation work that we're doing um, or, um, you know, other sorts of these like more consumer protection friendly um, uh, uh, initiatives that we might advocate for. And I think the third thing, which is sort of interesting is particularly with this like goal of a building a civil inclusive community, the origins of a lot of these American companies um, are deeply steeped in sort of like a commitment to libertarianism and free expression, which I understand and um, certainly uh, value in many ways. Because the origin of TikTok uh, didn't come from that same approach, it actually allows for, I think, a little bit more of a, an even global approach to balancing um, harm and free expression. We can't, we can't, there will never be a, a, a move to take down too much because we'd be subject to criticisms of suppression, but we don't have that same sense of everything must um, stay up. Uh, so in some ways, I think that again, allows for more of a healthy tension um, that might allow us to like sort of strike a, a good balance. So anyway, a bit of a long-winded answer on this one because it's super complex, um, yeah. but uh, I yeah, I think that those, those are the angles that I thought about it. Um, I love what you said there at the end where you're really kind of flipping this different, it, it being a non-American company as a strength in some way and how that allows you to come at these problems from a different perspective. I think that's so unique and not something that I've ever read about in a news story. Or I think someone who's not operating in the industry right now probably wouldn't be able to pick up on. Um, so I think that's a very, very interesting insight. Um, we're almost at time. I do have one question that I would love to ask you before we kind of wrap it up. 
Um, and that question is, what is one thing that the industry could agree on that would make the global experience of user generated content platforms safer? Kind of, you get to wave your wand and everyone agrees on one thing. Wow, that's a tough, good question. Um, I think if we could all get clarity on the role of government and its decision and, and sort of its role in helping to decide this free expression versus harm mitigation versus the role of the company. So mm -hmm. I think about how much Twitter was hit hard for not deplatforming Trump for violating many of its policies for many years. And they pointed, you know, to some version of the public interest and newsworthiness and the public has a right to know, et cetera. Uh, and they got hit for that. And then after the Capitol riots, they deplatformed him and Facebook deplatformed him too for you know inciting violence and violation of policies. And then they got hit for that because you know people were saying, well, who, these tech companies are too powerful. And like, you know, these sorts of decisions should sit with government. And it struck me that uh, it is a classic no-win situation. Um, and I think it will be hard to make these decisions either way. And if you have to sit and decide like, hey, if, if Twitter has to make this call about should Trump stay up or down, that's a hard decision to make. And you know, they must have, I don't envy them and, and I respect the moves that they made, but they're dealing with a meta problem of like, do they have the social capital, like the political authority to actually make the decision? Or are they supposed to wait for government who like, we can't pass any bipartisan bill at all. So it's not clear to me how government will like actually regulate themselves. Um, but I think it just places the whole industry in this like really tricky balance of like, I do believe that on the whole, most folks are like trying to do their best and maybe it's not as consistent as it might be or as transparent as it might be, but these things aren't easy. And so at least if we could get some like social agreement from governments and and the, the platforms about the appropriate role uh, for the platforms to play, that would at least uh, start to minimize some of the, the challenges that the industry has. Definitely. I take that friction out of the way and um, get to working together. I think that's such a such an important lesson. Um, we are almost, we are one minute there. So I want to, first of all, thank you so much, Justin. Um, and then say, how can, we're a group of operators, we're a group of smart generalists, how can we help you with the challenges that you are facing right now? Um, and that's an offer that you can either answer to today or um, follow up with us about, but we care a lot about the work that you're doing and would love to support you in carrying out that mission. Yeah, I think um, probably uh, the most helpful thing um, that uh, you all can help with is, is recruiting. Um, there's like a saying in, in politics uh, like that, that elected, that elected their staff is their, is their policy position, which is like who you bring on is ultimately, you know, the people who will shape the, the policies that electeds do. And, and, and very much, I think the same here. I, I think our goal at TikTok is to try and bring the best of existing tech experience, but inter, interweave it with different disciplines like academia, research, law, policy, government, um, uh, nonprofit, et cetera. So we're really trying to build a multidisciplinary and multicultural team, and we're still growing fast. So um, we're, we're hiring a bunch. Uh, if any folks here are interested, they should let me know. Uh, I'd love to send out, you know, Job, uh, job postings we're hiring for that um, you could share with your networks because ultimately um, I think the reason I'm passionate about coming here is no one has figured out how to do trust and safety uh, right. Um, we're still learning, you know, I, we've been figuring out these, these rules for, for societies for thousands of years and, you know, Facebook and MySpace started in 20, 2003 and 2004. So like, we have just started figuring out the online 
uh, way to interact. So um, the more smart multidisciplinary folks we get here, um, I think we'll really just strengthen uh, strengthen our approach and, and, and make us better. So uh, that's, that's probably my biggest ask. Definitely. And what you just described makes me think of so many of our community members. So um, I'll definitely make sure that we follow up to get to get everyone who wants to be in touch in touch. Um, I apologize to everyone whose questions I couldn't get to. They are phenomenal questions and I'm going to try to actually get them to Justin um, just so you can kind of see what what thoughts on our mind are um, after this. But thank you so much for your time. Thank you everyone for attending and um, have a great rest of your day. Thank you yeah, so, much, so much, Justin. Thank you. Really appreciate it. And thank you, Melda and Stan. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Bye. Bye. Take care. Bye.